Hello, this is the Education Committee of the Vermont House of Representatives. This is uh, the afternoon of January 21st, and we have Secretary Dan French in, who's going to give us an update on some of the things that the agency's been thinking about in terms of education in the period of COVID-19 and some, some of the future thinking. So welcome, Secretary French. Yeah, good afternoon. It's my pleasure to be here. Um, Jesse, uh, do you have access to put the slides up or um, is that something? Certainly do. I have them okay. right here, just a moment. Thanks. Yeah, as I, I typically do, I, I uh, created an outline, essentially a series of slides uh, to guide our conversation. Um, I think, you know, the, the impetus of this testimony was around uh, the idea of learning loss or for me, which sort of situates us talking about to the chair's point about the future or trying to make, I would say, make sense of what's going on right now and then trying to anticipate what the next um, phases of the response in the emergency would be. Um, and I use this phrase, um, recovery uh, from an emergency, emergency management standpoint. So, you know, like after the storm's over, we go into recovery. Um, I'm not sure we'll ultimately settle on this. It's, it's imperfect in some ways, but, um, and part of, part of what I'll share with you is that, um, we're kind of on the cusp of this a bit. There aren't many states that are ready to have this conversation. Uh, we, we are, um, as we continue to have done throughout the emergencies, reach out to our national partners to, to work in conjunction with others. Um, so I think to a certain extent, because of our conditions being uh, relatively positive, we've, we've ended up in this position where we're thinking about this probably a little bit more than some of our other states. Um, I think I mentioned previously, we, we started thinking about this in October, then had to stop thinking about it pretty quickly um, and to just focus on safe operations through the holiday period because our, our conditions started to deteriorate pretty rapidly in New England. And uh, that required, we knew immediately that we wouldn't have capacity inside the system for anyone to think about these ideas, let alone to put some actual effort into the planning. So um, I thought this would be a good way to um, talk about the idea of learning loss or kind of what that conversation uh, provokes. And, um, but it is designed to be a conversation. So I'll, I'll sh certainly share some information with you, but I'd be happy to uh, take questions on the way as well. So uh, Jesse, if you wanna to go to the next slide. So I'll, um, I'll use the phrase recovery again from an emergency, emergency management standpoint. Um, <clears throat> you know, when the storm's over so forth, the last phase is sort of the recovery phase. Uh, we're not there yet, um, but I think it's important to acknowledge that um, there is recovery work that has to happen in education, you know, uh, if that makes sense. It's, uh, this emergency certainly has been primarily a public health emergency, an unprecedented international global pandemic, if you will. Um, but this emergency could create uh, an education emergency if we're not careful. And we have, we have some opportunity to mitigate uh, that from actually happening to our kids. And that's, that's essentially what this, this concept is about, is like, what can we do um, to mitigate uh, the impact of COVID-19, the public health emergency on our kids from an educational standpoint? And we use the phrase education here broadly to include uh, not only their academic success, but their social, emotional well-being, their health, their nutrition. Um, you think of all the different functions that schools serve. Uh, so that's that's really the task before us. It's uh, you know it's not to say we can prevent this emergency from having impacted our kids. Um, the phrase mitigation, I think, is an important one. It's like we're going to do our best to reduce the impact as best we can, knowing that um, in spite of our best efforts, some kids are going to be more significantly affected than others. Um, and and I'll also uh, you know say that the focus here is on the impact of kids, but there's a whole bunch of other, you know, systems, the adults that work in the systems and the systems themselves that have been really put through a, a challenging time period. Uh, but I think what will emerge for a focus of a recovery is on the students, because that's what brings us all together and is uh, provides us some motivation to, to carry on in spite of the challenges. So if we could go to the next slide, Jesse. So I think, you know, in terms of the idea of learning loss, the first thing I'd say about that phrase is I, it's probably inadequate, you know, and um, I was on a national call uh, this week and I think there's, you know, let's say somewhat consensus. It's, it's convenient to use the phrase learning loss to think of education perhaps as a commodity, you know, X number of hours of services have not been provided. Therefore, how do we make up the difference? Um, but I think we'll, we'll find pretty quickly that that phrase is inadequate uh, to describe uh, the emergency in education. 
um, it's important to acknowledge that uh, the impact of the emergency is going to affect different kids differently. You know, so it's not it's not like all kids. You know, here's here's the beginning of why learning loss is inadequate. Not all kids are going to be adversely affected um, the same way or in the all the same academic areas. Uh, if you if you take elementary, for example, where you know, much of the learning is foundational to future learning, whereas high school, you're talking oftentimes about content. Um, those two things are not necessarily the same from a perspective of learning loss. Uh, it's also important to acknowledge that um, different schools will have different experiences. So it's not a case where we could even then say, well, K through three has this sort of experience, because in some districts, we might find that K through three is not the priority. It could be other grade levels. So um, you know, the, this point would be that we have to, we, at some point we have to go in and assess what's happened. And that's sort of the first phase of recovery is to go in and sort of do that triage or that assessment of what, what the impact has been. Um, I think it's fair to say that students that were at risk, more at risk before are probably even greater risk now. Um, so students that uh, have had support systems in place, family support, what have you, um, to, to, to get through this emergency, those students that didn't have those support systems that re required essentially schools uh, to provide that essential support in their lives, uh, they've probably been at more uh, at risk now than they were before. Um, certainly, you're all familiar with this idea that across our state and across the regions in Vermont, um, you know, there's uneven capacity to begin this work as well. So that needs to be acknowledged in our planning. Um, and we expect there's going to be a need to coordinate state services probably like we've never had to do before. So um, mental health is the obvious one, youth services, DCF and so forth. Um, there are other resources that are gonna to need to be brought to bear. Um, and part of our challenge is going to be to ensure that all, all areas of the state are being supported in that regard. And certainly uh, one area that's fairly optimistic right now is the funding, um, You know that there's gonna be funding necessary. So. Our funding paradigm previously was about reopening school, which was about PPE, disinfection, masks, you know, and so forth and so on. We have to sort of reprioritize our thinking around funding now to think about the recovery services kids are gonna need, the tutorial, the additional social emotional support, the activities, um, you know, we haven't done music in months. You know, all those, all those kinds of things are gonna have to be focused uh, in a way that allows us to do some prioritization and allocate our funding accordingly. But right now I'm fairly optimistic about the funding. We've received a pretty generous allocation under the ESSER program recently, and we expect there to be a, a yet another federal um, allocation or, or funding coming up. So we go to the next slide. So um, what we've been engaged in almost parallel to what we did or comparable to what we did for reopening schools, we want to anticipate going through a recovery planning process. Um, and this is kind of where we are right now. We're started having these initial conversations with stakeholder groups to develop uh, what I call a template. You know, like what are, what are the themes, which I'll go over in a minute. Um, and then uh, to really sort of take, take that conceptualization of that template out and test it a little bit into the practical world of implementation. You know, this, I think I mentioned last time, one of the, back to our summer work, um, we, we only have a finite amount of time to do the planning. At some point, we also have to carve out time for implementation, which is, since we're doing this in a very iterative basis, there's no experience that we use as a guide here. We have to sort of create a path forward. It's important that we, we kind of take a conceptual idea and try it on a little bit in the, in the sort of to flesh out what I call a planning process. So um, through the month of February, we'd sort of draft out what would ultimately become a planning process and then um, move through the, the month of March actually required then districts to go through that process at the local level and produce a plan. Um, and then certainly along the way to make sure, uh, I think you know this will become the, prior, the prevalent paradigm of our work organizationally, um, but we have other activities going on at the same time, particularly uh, around the use of federal dollars that, you know, the regular title funds and so forth that require continuous improvement planning. So we want to make sure whatever we're doing in this domain is integrated with other things. So it's not added on as another layer. Um, as I mentioned, I, my suspicion is this will become the prevalent uh, construct if we set this up appropriately. Uh, go to the next slide, Jesse. So these are the domains we're working with right now, and they're not hierarchical. They're sort of, they're all on equal footing. Uh, these might change a bit, uh, but this is based on conversations with, you know, we have an hourly, if not daily conversation with school districts um, based on our conversation with other state agencies and what we're seeing nationally on research and so forth. 
So we, we see three major themes emerging, our domains, uh, mental health and well-being, uh, the re-engagement. We, sort of, we started with the truancy concept and we wanted to expand that out to be sort of this broader category of engagement. Um, we know there's, there's some students that have not been engaged directly as much as others, and this is going to be a real challenge for us. And, and truancy is too simplistic um, and probably inadequate to address the issues. Um, and then, of course, uh, academic success and achievement. So you want to go to the next slide, Lizzie? So in, the, in terms of the Vermont context, uh, it was important for us to think about, you know, how, we, how do we go about doing this? And um, so much of where we are historically is about creating stronger school systems. You know, it's, that's our essential theory of action, I would argue, in Act 46. You know, for example, in Act 46, the idea was to put one school board in charge of multiple elementary schools. You know, the classic examples I travel around the state would be you have one school board for each elementary school, one school board for the middle school and the high school. And, um, you know, certainly that creates issues around coordination, but more often than not in terms of equity, you'd find that some elementary schools look totally different than other elementary schools. And I've been in supervisory unions in our state where you would think the elementary schools that fed into the same high school were in different countries, you know, based on the resources that are available to them. So the theory in Act 46 was to put one board in, to, in charge of that to say, okay, we have to acknowledge that these are all our kids, you know, how do, how do we address that locally? And start to put that sort of systems piece in place so the districts think of the kids as being all their kids, not just when they arrive at high school and go, how come these kids can't learn because they're from that town, you know, and we hear a lot of that. So yeah, also with 173, um, you know, I think the whole theory of action 173 to, um, you know, to give districts flexibility, certainly to address the disincentive that no doubt existed, I think, as a result of the block grant, but also to equip districts from a systems perspective to intervene with students, uh, not to necessarily say before special education, but to sort of buoy up the whole system um, and put that once again in a systems perspective. So it's not just one school here and one school there. I think another variable here, which is, is, is all important, has emerged probably before Act 46, um, even that going back to Act 153, is the issue of uh, staff availability and the demographic challenges we're going to face as a state, because the staff, staffing shortages issues are not just about enrollment or in other professions, they're also going to manifest themselves in education here. Um, the other sort of rationale, I think, for strong school systems is it's, sort of, it's an element that we can help control for staff turnover. Uh, so, so much of our systems that we do have going in the state that in many cases are state-of-the-art, some of the best in the world in terms of educational practice are highly predicated on individual leaders, individual teachers. And as soon as you have a turnover in staff, those systems are back to, in some cases, back to square one. Um, and, and we still have a turnover, particularly the role of principals are critical in terms of instructional leadership. We still have a turnover rate in principals somewhere around 20, 20%. So it's really hard to think about, you know, doing systems level work when your leadership is turning over on a 20% basis on an annual. You, know, you just can't, can't make headway in that regard. So once again, the idea of building systems that no matter who the leader is, they come in, there's something there for them to work with. There's a broader support framework. Uh, for principals as they do that work. And when we were looking about sort of the systems perspective, we can look at four basically called levers that exist in regulation. And these are oldie but goodies, I call them. You know, these have been around. These are sort of symptomatic of what Vermont education was about pre No Child Left Behind Act. You know, if you remember Mark Hall when he was commissioner, uh, those of you who were around then, this is what Vermont decided. These four things are decided. What Vermont decided to be sort of the cornerstone of, of effective school districts. You know, you got to have an educational support team for all students. Um, you got to have a local assessment plan. You know, you know, in this disposition of taking data and making sense of it as a, as a staff, you need to coordinate your curriculum, and you need to have a needs-based professional development plan. So these elements have been around for a while. Um, no Child Left Behind Act, uh, somewhere around 2000, you know, goals 2000. It sort of put all this on the back burner as a state. We got into the adequate yearly progress. But we're finding, you know, sort of amount of comfort in going back and look at these essential elements uh, because they're not all uh, equally well articulated across the state, particularly when we start thinking about Act 46. 
um, because in the old days, we talk about educational support teams being at the school level, not necessarily being at the district level. And that'll be one of the things we emphasize as part of a recovery for a number of reasons. Uh, if you wanna to go to the next slide, Jesse. So um, in terms of you know, contemplating, you know, thinking about those four levers and then contemplating um, how we would go forward in recovery, um, we think there's gonna be back to this idea of assessment or triage. We need to understand where districts are at in this work. So to what extent do they have a coordinated curriculum already? To what extent do they do have an EST? One of the first pieces of feedback we heard when we put out our sort of draft template of those domains is someone said something like 30% of our districts are ready to do this work. Another 30 are thinking about it and the other 30 don't know what you're talking about. You know, so it's, it's that's sort of the classic, I think, Vermont dichotomy is we have districts that excel at the systems level work. We have some that are sort of in the middle, then we have some that uh, really struggle. Uh, so we need to we need to figure that out um, and uh, to have some sympathy or attention to the regional variations in the delivery models that it, you know just because it looks this way in this county doesn't mean that's how it looks needs to look in this county. Um, in particular, we've been having regular conversations with the Department of Mental Health. Um, we know, you know, for example, the Northeast Kingdom is in a different organizational place right now due to organizational change that's happening in Northeast Kingdom Human Services. So the, the recovery planning that we do in the kingdom is gonna have to be uh, sensitive and responsive to the fact that they're, that mental health organization, that human service organization is in a different place than others that are well-established. They've had a tremendous turn over. And this is a huge opportunity for them to kind of reorient their system in partnership with their school districts. So in terms of how we get started with this, we, we're you know, back to those four levers. One of them is the educational support team. Um, we think the good starting point is to get that situated at the district level at each school district. When I say school district, these are like supervisory level structures, you know. Um, once again, EST was often done at the school level. Uh, but we're thinking, you know, our experience really on the surveillance testing that it's really useful from when the state comes in to have one entity at each district that we can interface with. And then the district then interfaces with its member schools. So particularly in this case where um, we have to do some triage and we need to understand what's going on in a broader region, not just based on a school basis. So that points to using the school district as the entity to collect some data you know, through an EST process to say, okay, what's going on in our system? You know, where is it the elementary students? Is it the middle level students? What are those priorities relative to those domains? And point, point the district to be responsive to its own context. The other issue is we're going to be bringing other state services in. So we wanna have an efficient way for state entities to interface with, with the school district. So that's here too, again, the EST, almost like an Act 264 team meeting, if you're familiar with that. You know, the idea that we would bring other people at that table uh, to talk about what they're seeing in terms of student uh, needs. Um, and, and by leveraging the school district, we start to get a footprint out into the region as well, because school districts, uh, the supervisory unions are generally regional entities on a, on a fairly large scale. I'm sorry, could you hold one, one second, sure. um, Secretary French? Uh, Representative Brady, did you have a, a question? Uh, yeah, I was just hoping you could explain again the EST at the district level, like who would be on, who would be on that? Yeah, this is, uh, thank you. Um, that this is a concept we have to flesh out as part of the planning process. Um, but right now we'd like to see an EST coordinator uh, established in the district at the school supervisory level. I think your district has such an entity um, that sort of looks across student supports in a, in a more general way. Um, but for many school districts, this is a hat someone's wearing, you know, in the smaller elementary schools as the principal or the guidance counselor or school counselor many cases, school counselors are shared across multiple elementary buildings. So it doesn't really have a good home. It's in, in once again, there's turnover. So you might have a good home for a couple of years and then it sort of falls apart again. Um, so we, I think we want to re-energize the concept of an EST, make it a little more systematic. Also see if we can work a system towards having a coherence on a referral process. Um, you know, so, you know, how do you, how do you, how do you bring students before that entity? So at a district level, really to have a coordinator, have some administrative time, someone who's holding the data and making sure that process is running well. Um, and certainly it's not to preclude holding ESTs at the school level, because I think some of that definitely will still need to happen. 
Uh, but particularly from a back again from a triage perspective, we're getting we're recovering from this emergency. We're not really sure what we're going to find. We need to have something sort of generally staffed uh, to provide some consistency and an efficient uh, point of intersect for other state services and funding. And just just to, to clarify, um, Act 264 is the 1988 uh, law that that uh, connected the designated agencies, uh, mental health agencies, with the schools. It hasn't been updated yes. in quite some time. Yeah, it's a very, I, I, as secretary, I've been to those uh, sort of annual meetings. It's always been a very useful process in Vermont to bring that sort of integration. Um, <clears throat> but here too, I mean, it plays out differently in different parts of the state. And um, when I was working in the Manchester area, my principals were, I won't say unfamiliar, but they didn't use 264 often. You know, they, they didn't see it regularly happen. When I was in Canaan, on the other hand, you know, arguably one of the most remote areas of the state um, we had difficulty getting state level services deployed into our location. So one way we got into that was to have a regular 264 meeting once a month, you know, so it was on our calendar. Everyone came to that, including the police and so forth. And we staffed cases on a regular basis that way. So it just, it, it plays out differently, but it can be a very useful structure. Um, okay, we'll go to the next slide. So in terms of, you know, the role of the state, I think we have a significant role uh, to support districts in this work. Once again, we're gonna have districts in different um, situations and in the regions of our state have different resources relative to state um, agencies and so forth and the configurations are different. Um, so we're, we're engaging in a couple activities I just thought I'd share with you. One is uh, we're going to be putting out um, a statewide contract on data literacy. So uh, this is, we're just about to ink the contract on this now. Um, with WestEd, you know, the sort of preeminent authority on how to do this. So we'll be working with districts to provide them direct support on how to look at their data, make sense of their data. This will be critical um, as we get into sort of the triage again or assessment of the impact of the emergency. Um, a piece that we picked out of 173, uh, largely uh, do some observations of the DMG group. I think you had Nate on earlier. Um, some of the work he's observed around uh, districts need some help on uh, scheduling their resources, resources in this case meaning personnel, how to deploy folks, the actual schedule drives so much of what we do in education. Uh, so we went out to bid on a, a tool to help districts do that with some professional development supports. So we're about to sign that contract now as well. Um, internal to the AOE, we currently staff uh, support teams for each school district largely around the continuous improving, improvement paradigm uh, around the, the title grants, if you will. Uh, we will now sort of reconfigure that to support the districts in a recovery process. So once again, we don't want them engaging in multiple planning processes. We can sort of bring these things together, but that's predicated to a certain extent on the agency uh, reconfiguring its support as well. In addition to agency staff doing this, we, we expect to bring in uh, other agencies as well, sort of staffing districts with a team from state government folks so that we can um, really provide consistent support across the state, regardless of the region that they're located in. Let me just check, Representative Brady, did you have another, another question? No, okay. Okay, please. Yeah. And then lastly, to this point about um, identifying where districts are in terms of their developmental need and then bringing like group districts together to work on problems of practice. So if there are districts that need more help in local assessment planning um, or would like to work on that, we would be the convening authority of the agency to help them do that and bring a re re additional expertise to bear. I think that's the end of my presentation. So oh, thank you very much. We we have um, a few minutes here for questions. I just I just want to start with the, the fact that we've had a presentation from Nate Levinson today. We have heard from Tammy Colby today, and all three of you are aligned in in a few things. One is the need for system wide. Yeah. Everybody's talking about system wide. Um, we're also hearing the need for regional thinking in terms of the ability to use resources. Um, at the same time, we have school districts that are trying to uh, separate from a larger picture, um, which, which is a challenge uh, going forward. Um, 
uh, Nate Levinson talked about his, his five areas uh, being the need uh, for core instruction, which will br brings up the question of where we are with MTSS and then um, time outside of core, highly skilled uh, professionals and, and system-wide. Um, and Tammy Colby, I don't know where my list went for her, but she has some, some similar, similar thoughts. Um, MTSS is our system that is supposed to be helping uh, differentiate instruction. And yet we're hearing that there are some, as you said, there's sort of the, the 30, 30, you know, 33, 33, 33 in there of those that are flyers, those that are working and those that really are, are far behind. With MTSS, do we, is there any oversight or checking in to see how districts are doing at a, at a wider level? Yeah, it's it's really uh, so much of um, you know. I, I appreciate Nate and uh, Tammy's observations, um, and it reminds me. Yesterday we had a state board meeting, you know, and, and I think we're pretty good at making the observations in the state. And one of the the big ones is um, somewhere in the middle here. I'll call it quality assurance, quality control, somewhere between regulation and requiring people to do things and and the policy design itself, which in many cases of Vermont is very good, uh, we're not as strong. You know, it's like, so how do we, we see at the agency, for example, one of our essential functions is oversight, which is sort of the regulation, but it's also support. And how do you transition from support to oversight? And what does that look like on a graduated basis? In many cases, we go from zero to 60. It's like, you know, either you're doing this and then you're in the regulation, you know, penalty area, but how do you, how do you kind of work through that continuum? So I think in terms of MTSS, I could show you tons of stuff on our website. You know, we have the planning tools, Been you know, this stuff's been well established in Vermont for over 20 years. And MTSS, I think I could trace back even farther, some sort of pyramid of intervention kind of concept. Um, this is why I think, you know, looking at 173 in particular, MTSS emerges pretty quickly as sort of the way to conceptualize our way into, um, a, you know, living inside a uh, block grant. Um, but I think here too, EST, I could have put MTSS in the substitute for EST because they're the same thing, essentially, from my perception. You know, we're going to, we want people to think about MTSS or EST from a district level, not just on a school by school basis. And that's that sort of triage idea that we're going to be sort of figuring out which kids need which supports, you know, more urgently than others is, I think, the difference. And you know, with an emergency, we're going to see some of that, you know, it's just like with the vaccine deployment, we only have X number of doses, what are we going to do first? So we're going to have to do some of that triage. I think the trick for us is going to be, um, and I think us as a state, is to leverage the recovery experience to make our system stronger. So by the end of recovery, we'd like to see MTSS well, well established, uh, as from a systems perspective and to make sure districts have the, the quality assurance and the quality uh, support that they, uh, they need to sustain that over time. So it's a good question. Um, I could point you to some tools, but you know, the, on the other hand, um, we've been at this for 20 some odd years and it's, it, in my own experience, some years you see it well-established and once again, a principal leaves or whoever leaves and then it's back, you're back to ground one trying to experience you know, the system in tears. Which, which does get to the question of capacity, the agent, capacity at the agency of education as we're looking at uh, some of the things that where we're, we're looking more systems wide, uh, district wide, region wide, and yet the capacity at the agency um, through no fault of the agency's own, um, partially as a result of the legislature in 2007, um, when um, you come in to present the budget that you have, I think there's going to be a keen interest in better understanding uh, where you are in terms of uh, personnel capacity and where we are in terms of uh, federal funds and state funds. And I know sometimes we're using state funds simply to, to, to be able to uh, tap into federal funds. Um, um, yeah, I, I look forward to those conversations. I, you know, honestly, I feel pretty good about, 
even some of this work, I think we're, I put up a red flag right now that's emerging literally on, on a daily basis. We have a new program inside of ESSER too. Um, if you're familiar with ESSER, the Elementary Secondary Education Relief Funds, uh, the federal government in this new um, allocation carved out a separate program for independent schools. Previously, uh, their strategy for independent schools was under ESSER 1 was in, included in this idea of equitable shares. Um, so we didn't, we didn't have any direct administration oversight, essentially, of those. I mean, that was something districts had to engage in with the independent schools in their region. Under ESSER 2, they've created a whole stand-up program, um, and this is causing quite a bit of concern. Uh, I had a call with my colleagues in New England this morning. We're all equally concerned. We've never done anything like this where basically we're going to be standing up new programs for independent schools and monitoring their expenditures to ensure compliance with the federal law. It's going to be new for them as well. They're, you know, the definition of independent is they don't often go through sort of that programmatic oversight. So it's going to be very challenging. And we've managed to, um, you know, keep our head above water during the emergency, particularly, you know, ESSER, CRF, all these federal programs require us to stand up applications, monitor them and provide fiscal oversight. We've been managing to do that, but this, this new program in ESSER 2 is, um, and it'd be very challenging. And they didn't give us a lot of money in administrative set aside to take care of it, you know? So uh, we're going to, we're going to have to figure that out. And there are different independent schools that have, have different um, oversight. There's a lot of them. Yeah. You know, so like with districts, part of our, you know, to your point about staffing, we become more efficient if we focus on working with 60 entities, as opposed to 294 with the independents, we suddenly take on 200 new entities, you know, because each one, none of them are affiliated with a district. You know, we have to deal with them on a one-off basis if they want to take the money. And, and there, many of them need the money. And, and there are funds that are available to you for one-time uh, additional personnel. Yes. And I don't think they're going to be sufficient. None of my colleagues think they're sufficient for the scale of this program, you know, but and anyway, I'll just put that out there and I'll talk more about it in detail. And there's also the possibility that some of those things could be changed with the new Congress. Yes, I mean, that's kind of where we are with ESSER 2 right now. I was just telling the superintendents, I'm in sort of in a two-week holding period on several different initiatives with the federal government because we're waiting for the Biden administration to sort of bring its regulatory perspective to bear on some of these programs. Um, I see Megan Roy has joined us. Um, I'm not seeing any hands. Uh, oh, Representative Conlon. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, your last point there is a little troubling uh, that all of a sudden you're going to have to devote resources and public school ESSER funds to this program. And I assume without any books being opened to see if any of these schools actually need the money or if any yeah, of I mean, these schools ran surpluses last year with taxpayer dollars. Uh, anyway, I'll get off that soapbox. I just, and, and one, just one point real quick. These aren't public school dollars. I mean, these are they've in fairness to Congress, they've allocated separate funds for the non public school program. So it's it's not it doesn't one of the solutions they created was it doesn't put the dollars in a competitive process like it was previously. So in fairness to that, these are dedicated funds for non public schools. Right. The challenge if, is, if, it's, if it's not enough to administrate. Where's the extra yeah, money it, it's, come from? And as you can, you know, the idea of working with 60 entities that are used to the bureaucratic oversight versus going to 200 that aren't ready to do that. Um, yeah. And we're not ready to do that. And every, every chief I talked to so far in the New England states and a little few nationally, I have the same concern. It's, we're not quite sure how to administer these programs or have the capacity to do so. And these have so to my, be approved. My question was that, oh, go ahead, Kate, sorry. The, these are all approved school independent schools? Yeah, that's correct. I mean, I don't think the federal law anticipates Vermont's arcane governance structure. So we, you know, they call it non-public non schools. It includes religious schools. Um, but once again, in, in the concept of emergency relief, we do need to put federal resources towards these schools. They need the money. Uh, I would also point out one distinction is um, under the payroll, the PPE, PPP program, um, under under this new ESSER II program, or it's actually under the GEAR program, independent schools that take PPP cannot also take the, um, the GEAR II funding. And so the they GEAR have to, funding is the, the funding that the governor uh, that's had. That's correct. Yeah. That's where they put this independent school program under the GEAR, yeah. GEAR II. Thank you. Um, Sarita, 
last question, I think, and then we'll move on to um, Megan Roy. Yep. Just, um, yep. I just want to say I share um, Chair Webb's concerns. Um, so it's a did on that. I guess I'm just wondering, are you saying that close to 30% of Vermont schools are not implementing the MTSS system? Yeah, I would, no, I would think it's fair to say, I mean, we use, I've heard that sort of, we should say, as the chair correctly said, 33, 33, 33 would be a better analogy. But I think it's, it's fair to say uh, from an organizational uh, systems perspective, there's always 33 of our school districts as systems that really are operating on all cylinders. You know, they have changes in leadership less frequently perhaps, but when they do, they're able to sustain and move they, they look at something like ESSER as an opportunity to leverage their strategic planning and they're ready, you know, they're already thinking about how they're gonna do these things. We have another third that are um, in a good position with some help to do that. You know, they'll, they'll ask for more technical assistance and, and so forth, but they, they can pull it together. And we have another third that um, don't answer the phone, you know, when, when, the, <laughs> when, it, when the phone call goes out and really, without direct support from the state would struggle. Um, and, and it's more often than not have devolved into a system where each school is sort of on its own trying to, to do things. Um, so it's, it's more a characterization of to what extent the schools within the system function as a system. Thank you. And you, I believe, do have some language coming to us on some of the things that you're looking to, to implement this year. Is that what I understand? Yes, we've, um, we've produced some policy ideas uh, as a part of our COVID response that are pretty much in sync with this. I think, you know, I'll just call out literacy reform. I know Representative Austin, when I was here last, expressed interest in that. We have interest in that as well. We see it situated in this construct of recovery. Um, we see it as an activity that folks should engage in as part of that sort of triage assessment, particularly the students in the younger grades. Grades. We also, once again, want to, I think, leverage uh, the recovery work to the greatest extent possible to put school districts on good footing after the, re after the emergency is over to uh, be stronger school systems. That would be our goal, I think. I just remembered, Representative Williams, you had a question about um, capacity as well in, in terms of uh, teachers. Did you want to ask about that? Um, yes, they, um, in my opinion, have a big plan coming forward. The concern that I have and many have are the positions, the people to fill those positions. Where are they going to come from? Yeah, no, it's, it's a, as I mentioned, a significant concern that, um, I think arguably we haven't spent enough time talking about as a state uh, due to our demographics, what we call in the profession, the pipeline development. Um, you know, so we, we are the second oldest state in the country behind Maine. Um, so we, we've had declining enrollments, but now that manifests itself in labor shortages across the board. You know, as I've, I've said to this committee on a couple occasions, when I go visit a school, most schools today have the same sign in front of them, which is bus drivers needed. Um, you know, so there's, there's shortage of staff across the board. So then when you start factoring in the ideas of pipeline, meaning, so where do we get our new teachers from? You know, we have the prospect of state colleges, our primary feeder system, consolidating or eliminating programs. Um, we have a pretty uh, complex uh, regulatory environment for new teachers moving in from out of state. You know, we don't necessarily have automatic reciprocity. It's something we're working on with other states. But we have to have a, a, a good look at those systems to say, you know, if we're going to rely on half of our new teachers coming from out of state, what are we going to, you know, what are we going to do about that? Um, but we're going to have to um, really, really start to address those pipeline issues. I've, I've observed sort of anecdotally that we'll, we'll probably see more schools close in the future, not due to the lack of students, but lack of teachers um, to do the work. What about growing those teachers within our state? building a yeah. solid program for that. Yeah, and that's, um, you know, honestly a demographic uh, I see often, um, I know you're up in the kingdom, uh, you know, as I mentioned, I was in Canaan. When I'm in rural areas, I tend to see more locals returning to teach in their buildings. So I think, you know, I don't have the firm percentages on that, but in the rural areas, we tend to see more local people returning to their communities to work. 
where the demographics of, um, let's say the more urban areas of Vermont generally have teachers coming from other places. Okay. Yeah, we do okay. have to learn to grow our own. Uh, could you tell me just another, just, I, I can't remember if you have a 173 uh, update report for us or not. And I can't remember if that's due this, something that's due this year or not. The Megan can speak to the committee provides a, an update on its work. Um, I'm not sure to what extent the agency provides an update. I'll have, I don't remember if that's mm -hmm. one of our reports, but we will uh, provide that update if that's. I think there was in 2018, but I think that was related to um, professional development. Yeah, I don't, I don't remember a formal reporting requirement. I know the advisory group has a formal reporting requirement um, and the state board will certainly speak about it when they, they give their update on the rule process. Okay, well, I thank you very much. Um, Good to see you. We're going to move over to uh, Megan Roy. Megan, I, I'm so happy to see you. I wanna just introduce the members of our committee so you'll know who we are. Um, I'm going to go to just our new folks. Um, we've lost a few and we've gained a few and it, it's, it's lovely to have them. So of our new folks, why don't we start with um, Representative Williams. Hi, I'm Terry Williams. I live in Granby. Uh, I represent the Northeast Kingdom, uh, Essex County, which includes the towns of Concord, Granby, Victory, Maidstone, Lunenburg, Brunswick, Guildhall. Um, I have been in the administrative side of the schools uh, in Concord. I've been a coach, uh, an athletic director, and uh, a, I owned a store where a lot of these kids ended up working. Thank you. Representative Harrison. Good afternoon. Representative Harrison, first year legislator representing Weathersfield and Cavendish. Representative Brown. Thank you. Good, good afternoon. I am Jana Brown, uh, also a new newly elected legis legislator uh, serving the town of Richmond, Vermont. Um, and my year round job is with a literacy nonprofit that works across Vermont and New Hampshire. And Representative Brady. Hello, I know Megan well from CVSD, so <laughs> yeah, I'll leave it at that and I'm gonna have to jump off for a few minutes to pick up a kiddo from CVSD and then I'll be back on, thanks. Okay, thank you. And um, Jesse, can you just say hello so you'll know who you've been talking to? <laughs> Hi Megan, uh, nice scheduling with you. Um, I'm the new committee assistant for House Education this session. Great, so we've appreciated having, having Jesse join us. So welcome, Megan. Uh, Megan, you are the chair of the um, census-based funding group that was that originated out of Act 173, and we have heard today from Nate Levinson. We have heard from um, Tammy Colby in relation to um, the development of 173, not the waiting study, um, and we also had uh, our ledge counsel Jim Demaray. Uh, talk to us about some of the features in Act 173. So you, I think today, are providing us with an update as to where, where you are with 173. Is that correct? Um, well, uh, I can certainly do that. Um, I, w I think I had tailored this a little bit more specifically to COVID recovery. Um, and, I, and I did want to make clear to the committee that um, I will draw connections between what I'm sharing um, and the conversations of the advisory group, but the advisory group hasn't specifically taken up the issue of COVID recovery. Um, okay. And so I just want to make sure you're aware of that. Um, and, but to go back to a question that you were asking Secretary French, Kate, um, the, and I see that Ted Fisher is on here, but the advisory group did submit their um, report to the General Assembly. Um, I don't want to put Ted on the spot, but I think it it came via the agency, but that was submitted before the 15th of January. Um, and I am happy to answer. Does that sound familiar? Is it something that you've seen? It, it, it does sound familiar. Um, okay. I don't Great. think it hasn't come to the committee yet, but why okay. don't you, Megan, your, your experience is so rich. I'm just, just talk to us. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Sounds great. Um, and like I said, I, Came, I'll start with the COVID recovery piece, although it is very connected to Act 173, MTSS, and existing structures, which sounds 
just from the tail end of what I heard Secretary French talking about sounds like in alignment with what you've probably heard from others today. So, um, so you know, I think what I wanted to share um, about COVID recovery in Vermont and how we address that is um, we all know that COVID-19 has had a lasting impact on students, on families, uh, and it will for the, for, for the foreseeable future. Um, and I think that we have to keep two things in mind as we react to and plan for COVID recovery. Um, first, we need to make sure that we're making decisions based on data and not just global um, either assumptions or kind of what we hear in the ether around what's needed. Um, and then second, and this is particularly important to the advisory group, um, we need to be building and expanding existing structures. Um, the pathway to recovery is on the structure of a multi-tiered system of support, which is what Act 173 desires to bring forward, along with flexibility of funding and lots of other things. But, um, and, uh, you know, I, I will share a, a few thoughts specific to um, any one-time funding that might be available to schools and how they can use that in a way that moves forward existing structures so that we're not sort of, um, you know, receiving a one-time benefit of, of money that doesn't help us um, in the long term. Um, so in terms of that first piece, the uh, kind of basing our actions on data, um, I do think we need to reframe the concept of recovery a little bit. If you listen to the national narrative about the impact of the pandemic, and I, and I hope this isn't in, uh, interpreted to be taking the pandemic lightly, because I don't mean to do that. But when we talk about educational recovery and we talk about the impact, um, it's all in very global terms that all students have been impacted. Um, and that's true. And in some ways that gives us a sense of urgency to react and respond that we need. But there is a risk to the idea of thinking that every single student is impacted and therefore needs something. Because if we have that assumption and we are in receipt of funding or support or resources, and we try to spread those resources across all of our students, we're going to water down um, and, and potentially take things away from the kids who need it most. Um, most districts are engaged in collecting kind of interim data about how their students are doing. And for, for many students, um, they're certainly impacted. They had lost learning opportunities, um, but they're still where they should be by and large. So we need to be careful that when we use funding that we need to laser focus uh, not just funding, but our efforts on the kids that are impacted. Um, students who are historically marginalized, students with disabilities, students who were struggling before the pandemic, students who were unable to access um, remote instruction um, or even hybrid instruction that's happening right now. Um, and, and I think that it also allows us to make sure that we reflect on what school systems did do during the pandemic. There are some shifts to remote instruction that benefited systems, that benefited schools. And some of those things can be built upon. So I would just caution us to make sure that we take it down from a very global um, conversation to a really specific one. Um, and so that really requires that we identify and support those students most impacted. So districts that have multi-tiered systems of support will have a component of their structure that collects data, common assessment data, local common assessment data, and analyzes it and identifies very quickly the kids who need help. The districts who have those structures are already doing that right now. Um, they're looking at whether kids have lost ground in basic skills. They're looking at the proficiency gap and whether or not it's growing and for who and in what areas. Um, so districts need to be able to examine that assessment data so that they can uh, react. They need to be able to disaggregate that um, and look really closely at the indicators of learning loss. Um, I think when people hear data, they often think of national data like SBAC. Um, I think school districts are going to need support in using local assessment data over the next at least short period of time because 
uh, for one thing, FSAC wasn't implemented last year. It, uh, if it's impacted, if it's implemented this year, the validity needs to be examined because of uh, we're going to have lots of kids who don't take it, things like that. So we need to be really supportive of schools um, having the right data to be able to channel their support. Um, and the other piece in terms of supporting the right population, um, and I'm sure you've heard this before, but we do need to keep mental health and social emotional learning in mind. It's not just academic areas that are um, impacted, especially for marginalized um, students and families. Um, so when we think about measuring COVID impact, we also need to measure uh, non-academic structures. And, you know, I think the theme there is, you know, bringing this back to Act 173, and I think Secretary French was talking about variability. The, the districts that have these structures in place, or at least are familiar with the structures, they're gonna be able to do this. And the schools that don't are gonna to have to target their resources and help to those structures. And, and I think we need to be thoughtful about that or else we risk kind of throwing, uh, throwing something on the fire and not, and not having it actually put it out. Um, so shifting a little bit to, if we think about recovery, um, and I talked in my comments that you can um, read about one-time funding, and I sort of mean that um, just, so, just so your committee is aware of thoughts if you are thinking about one-time funds, but these are also applicable to existing funding streams that, that school districts have. Um, and school districts still need support in figuring out how to spend the money already available to them in a way that's more flexible. Um, so we already sort of talked above about um, targeting funding on the most impacted students. Um, you know, in years past, sometimes when funding is available, it's made available to all families and families can say, well, I'm gonna access some outside tutoring for my child. Um, that's one of those things that families who need that the most may not be able to navigate the process to get it. Um, and you're kind of spreading the, the funding really thin. The things specific that I think are in alignment with what Secretary French said is we really need to build upon current school improvement structures. So all school systems, all districts are required to create a continuous improvement plan. Um, districts who are receiving equity support have to submit a plan for that. Um, so these are already part of our structures and rather than adding a layer of, so you need your continuous improvement plan and you need a COVID recovery plan. Those two things should be merged um, together. Um, you really need to focus on enhancing existing structures. I think that would be the biggest takeaway of the conversation. Um, and MTSS is the structure. That is exactly how we will find the kids who are struggling figure out what they need and bring it to them. If we, and that sounds very simplistic, but that's what a multi-tiered system of support is. Um, and with an eye toward things that will benefit Act 173 implementation in the long run, if districts are using one-time funding, um, how can that funding be used to also build capacity at the same time it's reaching kids directly? Um, some of those options could be uh, expanded intervention programming over the summer. Um, and that programming could be tailored so that it is being received by kids, but also um, uh, providing professional development to teachers. So that's called a lab school model. But teachers are coming, they're teaching kids, but they're being taught themselves while they do it. So one-time funds could be used for that. Short-term coaching positions so that we can infuse um, support to districts to help them analyze their structures, um, figure out what professional development is needed. Um, and, you know, you were just talking about early literacy, um, professional development for first instruction. I mean, that was the conversation in last year's session about raising the ability of classroom teachers in Vermont to be able to teach literacy to more of our kids. And when we do that at the first instruction level, it will reduce the number of kids who need help and therefore the help can become more expert and more targeted. Um, so I, again, Kate, I, 
that those are my thoughts specific to recovery. I'm happy to make a stronger connection to 173 or answer other more general questions, whatever you need. Um, let me put out to the group, um, Representative Austin. Megan, can you just uh, talk a little bit more about the professional development first instruction level? I haven't heard that used before, so just. Yeah, so we know, we know that we need to raise the expertise of our teachers. And the best kind of professional development is the kind where you receive some instruction and then you practice it. And then you have someone come in and watch you do it and give you tips. And that's really hard to replicate in a classroom, but you can create a laboratory classroom where the coach is built into the structure of the program and a summer intervention program kind of lends itself to that. So a teacher, and I'm making this up a little bit, but a teacher could be teaching a four week program that has a coach embedded in it. So the students in the program are receiving really intensive, high quality intervention, but the teacher is always also receiving first instruction. And, um, you know, we already have in lots of schools around the state, um, deep professional development happening in early literacy and structured literacy. Um, so, so literacy is the first place that my, um, that my brain would go in terms of the topic, but you could certainly replicate that for math or other areas. So first instruction isn't the elementary grades, like it doesn't ah. refer to the elementary grades. No, thank you. Okay. That's my, okay. no, that's a good jargon bus. By first instruction, I mean classroom teachers. Gotcha. <laughs> um, the, the, the general ed setting as opposed to intervention. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah, yep. Okay, Representative Conlon. Uh, this may be a tie to 173. Um, both you and, and uh, our speakers this morning talked about the need to have flexible funding that could be, you know, sort of targeted um, to be most effective. And I'm just trying to remember, I could have brought up Jim's timeline, but at what point does the, what does 173 allow schools to use their, their special ed funding in flexible ways? Yep. What so year, I guess? Yeah, it's fiscal year 23. So the 22-23 school year, which means the budget that we build next year uh, builds for a new special ed funding. So, so that does not appear soon enough to deal with sort of the immediate problems. Um, and I guess, could you talk a little bit about the flexibility as far as you know, that is gonna be available with some of the federal funds that are coming per CRF or ESSER? Yep. Yeah. And, and it's a, that's a good observation because what that means is we have at least for next year, the remainder of this year and next year, we have to work within our existing funding structures to do this COVID recovery, which means school districts need help to maximize at least the flexibility that we have now. I'm sure you've heard, I I'm sure Dr. Colby talked about it, but so have others. There are ways to use some grant funding that we have now in a more flexible way. So, I, uh, so one solution is helping schools really quickly figure out how to use that more flexibly. With the one-time funds coming in, the at least the funding we've received so far, there you know two pots of money. One had to be very specifically tied to new expenses, teachers, masks, PPE, right? Like. But then the second um, pot of funding actually was used very similarly to how our title grants and other um, consolidated federal program grants. So schools are pretty familiar with how to deploy those funds, but they will need some help from the agency with how to do that flexibly. So it is possible, it is possible to use that funding in this way, but some schools are gonna need some help. What is your recommendation on the role of the legislature? Do you have a role that you would see that would where we could be most helpful and where we could be most unhelpful? <laughs> <laughs> well, so I mean, I having to get both having fit in, in both categories. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I and I hesitate for this to sound like the drum of don't do anything, because um, I'm sure you read that line in the report. But I think, it, I think it is important, especially now, you know, I think the things that I've shared suggest that 
the, the um, laws already exist right now within which we can recover. And Act 173 is the most specific one. So we already have the structure on which to do what we need to do to recover from COVID. Um, so one piece of advice would be to let that happen, to let Act 173 um, continue its transition or our transition to that funding model. We do need that flexibility in funding. Uh, I know that the, um, the, the question of, of further delay or whether or not we should even change our funding structure does come up periodically. Um, I think we need to stick with it. I think, I think we need to stick with the structure of 173 because the intent of that legislation is part of what will help us out of that. Um, part of what made 173 uh, work was, were the recommendations of uh, DMG and Nate Levinson. And there was supposed to be professional development coming um, statewide, but that much of that did not happen. Um, what do you see as needed in that area? I know we, we do have a bill coming forward related to literacy, which we're hoping, hoping will, will help in that regard. And, and you know, you H101 now, I think. I haven't actually looked at it, but Serena, it, it's a lot of it is our bill from last year, but I, I believe she's tied it to COVID. Yeah. Okay. Um, you know, I, I, I think what's needed in terms of professional development is really concrete ways schools can figure out where they are relative to MTSS, find their own. It, it's a little bit like schools need their own intervention. We need to figure out where they are find out what they need and provide it. And, it, and it's that sort of systematic plan. Um, and again, I, I was here for part of Secretary French's um, piece where he said, we have all the material. We have the outline. Um, the agency has given a, um, a framework for responding to 173 that couches each of the pieces. He talked about ESG. So the stuff exists. It's helping schools know where to start. So it's coaching, it's um, having someone come into your system who can help you figure out where you are. Some districts already know where they are and they're gonna go directly to maybe a piece of a DMG recommendation. They're gonna say, My, our issue is that we need more time for kids to receive intervention so they don't get pulled out of first instruction. And so they're gonna work with someone around changing their master schedule. Another school is gonna say, our problem is in early literacy expertise and we're gonna launch into professional development. That's a component of MTSS. But some schools don't know where to start. They don't even know where in that pathway. So that makes the answer, of, answer to your question, Kate, kind of complicated because what people need is the ability to figure out where they are so that they can jump into something. One of the things he also was recommending uh, in terms of building that capacity is a more regional approach. Um, to help to help uh, with professional development to perhaps take on the five recommendations that he has, not just one of them, but all of them in a, in, in a package, that that is more likely to be uh, affordable if delivered regionally rather than one school district and then people retire and it's forgotten. Mm -hmm. um, your sense on that? I think that's probably true. I mean, I happen to be in a large district myself in a large region. And so that's probably slightly less true for us, but certainly true for others. I, what I can say is that being consolidated has made it easier for us to do our work. And so if that's a microcosm version of um, more rural districts, that does point to the need for a regional approach. And at the same time, we have districts that are trying to break mergers. Um, so we have districts that are merged and, and I, we have heard that uh, some, some forced mergers in many ways because their two elementary schools were merged into the same district, uh, were able to share resources. Um, I'm sorry, I don't mean to make this a discussion about Act 46, but I'm continuing to hear the need for a more regional approach. And at the same time, we have communities that are really, really struggling um, with a fear of losing a, a small school in the process. So. Any words of wisdom for us? <laughs> I mean, you have a very successful district in that, yeah. Right, and well, we, and we had a district 
who, who approached consolidation in a positive light. And so I sort of recognize that my experience is different than others. But what I can say is we were able to realize much, much more consistency in, in implementation of all of these structures once we consolidated. So I, I guess I would just reinforce it really does, it really does help to work together. I'm not seeing any other hands. Um, anything from anybody? Um, Representative Conlon? Oh, I had a good question. It may have gone out of my head. <laughs> Before you go, uh, it was another 173 related one. Oh, yes. Um, uh, again, I don't have the timeline up that Jim created for us, but at a certain point, the AOE was supposed to bring on two special ed specialists. And I didn't know if that had happened yet and what role they could play in some of these steps moving forward. So my that that was actually supposed to happen pretty early on. Uh, that didn't have a delayed uh, implementation like the actual rollover. Um, I actually think that was supposed to be right off in 2018. Um, I, I don't know of positions that exist that are tagged specifically to Act 173. Secretary French could tell you, I'm, I'm sure it's, I know who our contact is for Act 173, but it was a, it, it's a division director who is already at the agency. So I don't exactly know how those, how those positions were used. The advisory group has certainly asked that question um, of, of the agency because it is difficult for the advisory group to see where those positions are and to see their connection to professional development, which was the intention, was to bring on resources for that. And I, I think the advisory group has struggled to see where those are. If I remember correctly, I think they just moved a few people from within the agency. So there was no real position created. They just moved some people around. Yeah, and I think they, they called that, they, but um, we can check. Will you remember, will you remember to, to ask that uh, of uh, Bill Bates when he comes in, if you, he knows that? Megan, you'll be back at some point. Um, I'm sure we will be interested in uh, your feedback on, wait, H, is it 101, Sarita? Yeah. H101. Um, we yes. also, also just have had a bill that came through related to community schools and community school model for some districts within high poverty as a way to address, you know, equity. It's not the whole thing cannot always be addressed within a, a school and that there are often some other aspects that, mm -hmm. that families need. So we're going to be looking at that as well. Um, and we're also going to take another look at construction. You should you should know. I might not be the expert to talk about construction, but no, <laughs> but we certainly have a few in that area. <laughs> um, Sarita, did you did you have a last one? Yep, yep. Just, I just want to say how glad I am, Megan, to hear that you're looking at data. Um, <laughs> I love data, but. Honestly, I've been looking at like research on uh, disasters with children and I can't find any data, you know, that supports that all children are gonna be impacted. Um, and as a matter of fact, this is like, this has never happened before. So I don't think there is any data. So I love that you're depending on data to inform your kind of instruction and, and you know, your work. Yeah, I, 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 yeah, I agree. It's hard because I don't, no one wants to be the one saying, but a lot of kids are fine um, be, because it, I don't, I, it really, I, we're not trying to be dismissive, but we are trying to say, but some kids are not fine and many are gonna be okay, <laughs> but the ones that are not are really, really impacted. So I do think it's important. We just have to figure out how to, how to find them well. And we have certainly heard that from the field. Okay, I don't think I see anything else at this point in time. Representative Coopley, you all set? Okay. Great. Okay. Thank, thank, you. thank you so thank much. Thank you, Megan. Um, thank you, everyone. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. Bye. So in terms of tomorrow,
Um, tomorrow we will we will hear from the agency right after floor, and this is just our COVID nineteen response update. Um, if you have things that you would like the agency to be reporting, um, I know I can't always hear the governor's speech. I often miss it. If there are things that, that you are interested in knowing in relation to schools, in relation to schools related to testing, where are we <laughs> in terms of the, the age groups? Um, it, you know, just let me know and we'll, we'll make those questions, uh, we'll post those questions. Um, we will have, then we'll have a bill presented. Um, after that, um, I think it's, it's related to studies. Okay. And then, um, we will hear how, um, we will hear from the agency of education regarding, uh, coronavirus relief funds that were appropriated in September. Um, so we're obviously before that, but um, to see how those have been spent. Um, this is also related to uh, HVAC um, improvements that were made. And there is a question I need to respond the, to the agent to the appropriations committee related to the budget adjustment act. There's one item in there. Um, related to using some of the uh, coronavirus relief funds that were not uh, have not been used to use that for uh, Burlington High School to be able to actually have a school uh, while they're under uh, PCB challenge. Um, so that would be it. So we should be able to end a little bit early tomorrow. Uh, that's my hope. Um, Jesse and I are working, Jesse and, and uh, Representative James and I are actually working on scheduling for the following week. Um, and I will, we'll, I'll know a little bit more about that tomorrow. Chair, what hey. could I add a little bit for scheduling tomorrow? Excuse me? Could I just add uh, in regard to scheduling for tomorrow? Yes. I have added uh, just a couple of witnesses for the HVAC funding following the agency of education tomorrow okay as planned but they're officially on the agenda now on the committee information page and we've also added a bill presentation on h yeah yes but i still expect we should end early yeah before 3 30. kate yes um just uh so i think you, you just to be clear uh, Bill Bates should also be listed as speaking to the budget adjustment yes. as well yes. yeah. Yeah. on the agenda. Yeah. Um, and it, so you may want to just bump him to 1115, start off with Bill Bates speaking about budget adjustment. Right. That's a 10-minute that's a conversation. Yeah. Um, and then uh, the other very glaring problem with the agenda tomorrow is I, I don't see the word lunch in there anywhere. <laughs> Pushy. Are we going to Are we going to gear up and just push through and then get done at a good time? Is that the oh, idea? Oh, I, yeah, we, I guess we're just going to uh, grab break when we can. Uh, um, thoughts? There's no, there's no chance we could make that tax workshop. From twelve to one. Yeah, you got oh, the tax right. workshop. Yeah, too. so so yes, yeah, so we'll get through. We're at eleven fifteen. We'll yeah, put eleven. Put okay. Put put noon in there. <laughs> there we go. There's time allotted. There's just no yeah. official lunch event. <laughs> but yeah. I will add. I'm it. coming back after that. Yes, coming hey, back. We have uh, the VSC work group at noon tomorrow. Say that again. We have the VSC work group at noon tomorrow. Okay. Oh, that, you and that I should do? be on your calendar too. Okay. Okay. So the tax workshop, um, it's it's recorded, so you can watch it later. Oh, okay. You want to take a walk instead? Oh. Uh, and you can also watch it at double speed. Yeah. <laughs> and there's a there's something written, but but the tax workshops are really really very interesting and. Um, the, though you don't have to, this is not the exact moment that you need to know about it. Right. And I forgot they were recorded. So if you want to work through noon, then I can watch it at another time. I don't want to work through noon. 
I'm going to, you guys have to have some time. Um, yeah, so we'll just, just call it noon break. We'll, we'll, we'll end. We may even end before that. Um, but just say noon break. And you can put in parentheses that the tax workshop that you can watch with your screen off and have your lunch. Yes, I do do that. And we're five minutes after floor tomorrow. Is that the same? Yeah, I'd say it's it's probably ten minutes before, but five come in within five minutes, yep. and then we'll start. We'll start ten minutes. Okay. I overruled myself. <laughs>